Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Now, uh, who's been conducting you most recently? Herbert von Karajan, Sir Thomas. Oh, excellent, excellent. Sort of musical Malcolm Sargent. <laughs> what are we running through today? The pathétique, Sir Thomas. Well, we have to see what we can do to cheer it up. <laughs> the English do not really care for music, but they absolutely love the noise it makes. <laughs> what else have we here? Symphony Number no. 3 of Brahms. Suitable for all weathers, all seasons of the year. Music, gentlemen, should sound beautiful. First and last, it should enchant the ear. That's all it was intended to do. Never mind the inner significance. No time should be wasted worrying about metaphysics or philosophy or criticism of life or what the composer is saying. Music is simply sound. Either you like it or you don't. Right, come along. <laughs> You see, gentlemen, in this piece you may find it a matter of some difficulty keeping your places. I think you might do well to imagine yourselves disporting in some hair-raising form of locomotion, such as Brooklyn's or a switchback railway. <laughs> My advice is merely hold on tight and try not to let yourselves fall off. I cannot guarantee to help you back on again. There are two golden rules for an orchestra. Start together and finish together. <laughs> The public doesn't give a damn what goes on in between. Right, once again. <laughs> The image of Sir Thomas today in the memory of our nation is of a grand old man moving in state, slowly and decorously, almost benignly institutional. In the prime of his life, he stood upright, but without stiffness, the easy charm of Oxford mixing with the confident alertness of a commander-in-chief sniffing the battle. When I began my career after leaving music college, I read an advertisement placed by Sir Thomas who wanted the services of a music secretary and librarian. When I finally managed to track him down, he was recording. The London Philharmonic Orchestra were playing the introduction to Act Three of Lohengrin. The silence that followed all he said to me was hello but then he told me to come and see him on Sunday at his flat in Hampstead yeah. 
Well, what do you want? I've come to see you, sir. What for? Uh, well, you asked me to. Oh, yes, yes. Come and sit down. Uh, tell me a little about yourself. Would you care to drink something? It's Sunday morning before luncheon. Perhaps an aperitif? May I have a sherry? You write musical criticism, don't you? Yes. Well, no sherry for you, then. It's too liverish. <laughs> Try a white lady instead. Now, you are to come and see how my great machine works. Come and see me tomorrow morning at Covent Garden Opera House. I shall want you to be my odd job man. First of all, you must play any operas from score that I may wish to hear, and I know you can. Your principal told me so. Next, you must bring my full scores from the theatre to me here as and when I want them. And then you must ask my secretary, Miss O'Donnell, where my little alpaca jacket is which you must always place on my desk in the morning. It's my conductor's desk, I mean. I shall want you to catalogue my library, all this library here, and pick out any pieces you think might be interesting for a book that I'm writing about my friend Delius. One more thing. I'm sending you on visits to interview people, and I want you to go to Norwich to see a crashing old boar who's the secretary of the festival there. <laughs> you must stop him from persuading the choir to perform some wretched old chant called the... I can't remember, something about the tribes of Israel. Never mind, it's a dreadful piece and they mustn't do it. How about another white lady? And from that Sunday morning, everything seemed enchanting and wonderful to me. While at the same time, Beecham became exacting and quite ruthless. Where's my alpaca jacket? Here, Sir Thomas. Have you and Turtis marked up the scores for Paris? Uh, uh, very nearly, Sir Thomas. Well, where are you now? Where are you hiding? I've got the Don Giovanni violin no, part, No, no, Sir no, Thomas. this won't do at all. I want you to rescore the entire recitative for Don Giovanni. I don't care for the effect of the harpsichord. What is wrong with the harpsichord, Sir Thomas? Well, it doesn't sustain Mozart's chords, and I don't care for the noise it makes. It sounds like two skeletons copulating on a corrugated iron roof. <laughs> in a hailstorm. <laughs> My idea is to rescore the entire continuum over divided cellos. See that it's done at once and you'd better tell Mr. Turtis. But, sir, there'll hardly be time Don't talk to me about time. Just get the parts rescored. For the divided cellos. Often only two minutes before a concert, we would be summoned to Sir Thomas and given a mass of entirely new instructions. And whenever the time factor was mentioned, there was always a roar of abuse. And whatever happened on these occasions, Lionel Turtis, the principal viola player, would always say, no man has done more for British music than Sir Thomas. <sighs> and so we would take off our coats and start all over again. In performance, I would stand there transfixed with delight and astonishment. And it was then that the struggle to serve Sir Thomas seemed utterly worthwhile. And you became his slave again. He had this strange gift for radiating security, charm and kindness. And to me, he became something of a father figure. What's that book you're reading? Goethe. Goethe? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, ho. How can you read Goethe? He was a colossal and conceited bore and something of a dabbler. Do you read much in German, Sir Thomas? Well, I hardly can, and I hardly care to. Heine, of course, appeals to me, but then he was a Jew. So not even the German language got in the way of his wit. <laughs> but surely Goethe's love poems affect you? A literary affectation. Goethe ran away from sex. He was a spinster. <laughs> Perhaps you feel happier with German music. Bach is, I think, my most potent aversion. Too much counterpoint. 
Protestant counterpoint. <laughs> Bach composed in only two tempi, quick and slow, but his music is associated in Protestant countries with biblical texts, which are, of course, sacrosanct. Nearly all the questionable works of the great composers have been prompted by religion. Wagner's Parsifal, The Requiem of Brahms, Elgar's Gerontius, described by my friend George Moore as holy water in a German beer barrel. <laughs> what dreadful crimes have been committed in the name of religion? The Missa Solemnis is mostly second-rate Beethoven. In fact, most of Beethoven is second-rate anyway. Oh, now, Sir Thomas. That is measured by the value set up by? Mozart, Sir Mozart, Thomas. Mozart, exactly. I mean, look at the last movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. What can you do with it? Bump it a little, little, dump it a little, little, dump it a little, little, la da da. It's like a lot of yaks jumping about. <laughs> but what about Beethoven's last quartets? Well, Beethoven's last quartets were written by a deaf man. <laughs> and in my opinion, should only be listened to by a deaf man. <laughs> German music needs to be ruthlessly exposed, and I could produce an opera here in England just as well as they do it in Salzburg oh, or anywhere else. Well, certainly, but in Salzburg, even if all the singers, instrumentalists and technicians were suddenly somehow killed in an earthquake, the Salzburg festival would still go on. Yeah. They'd simply bring in a fresh opera company from Munich or Vienna. So? But if you were giving a festival in England and you chanced to die suddenly, that festival would totally collapse. Nonsense. No, you're quite right. <laughs> There's no secret about it. I just get the players and let them play. Any mistakes they know about as well as I do. So we play it through again. Then they know it. And I know what they're going to do. They don't know what I'm going to do. So at the concert, everyone's on his toes and we get a fine performance. <laughs> Sir Thomas's entire working days and years were presented to an audience. I often wondered what manner of man he was when alone and unobserved. Well, as a child, I was the delight of my mother and father. I hardly ever spoke. <laughs> my father was a member of a Lancashire family enriched by the manufacture of pills. Yes, the very same. <laughs> He spoke an uninhibited Lancashire speech which has found no place in my own persona. My existence passed in silence and in contemplation until I reached my sixth year when I was taken to my first concert. This was a pianoforte recital and the series of a new pieces by Grieg gave to the programme an unusual distinction. Long after I'd been put to bed that night, I lay awake thinking about my novel experience. The music revolved relentlessly in my head, over and over again, like a blatant merry-go-round at a country fair. Suddenly, a daring idea came to me. I walked downstairs to the drawing room where I heard voices, opened the door, advanced to the middle of the room and said, please may I learn the piano. The spectacles fell from my grandfather's nose my mother tried to scream, but surprise had robbed her of voice. <laughs> my old nurse burst into tears, but the following morning, the Don Basilio of our establishment, the local organist, was called in. I found the lesson wholly to my liking, even though the old upright piano on which I played could best be described as a growth adhering to the walls of most semi-detached villas in the <laughs> provinces. <laughs> However, when years later, I went to public school. I found myself withdrawn from music, apart from the occasional visiting party of glee singers and comic recitalists. And when on one occasion, in the middle of a concert largely given over to Scotch ballads and imitation Negro songs, 
A foreign violinist appeared to play an arrangement of the prize lead from De Meistersinger. The shock and delight was too much for my starved ear. When another boy interrupted my reverie by kicking me, I seized him by the hair and beat him. <laughs> we were both ejected from the room by my <laughs> housemaster, who said very reproachfully, and I always understood, Beecham, that you were fond of music. I thereupon withdrew from house activities and grew a moustache. <laughs> One Christmas holidays, my father came to me and said, Now, look here, lad. I've spent a lot of brass on your musical education, and now I want you to help me. Every year, Beecham's Pills published a Christmas carol annual, and he placed a copy of this in my hand. Now tell me, said, I want you to go through the annual and alter some adverses so as to advertise business, you know. <laughs> so, I retired to my study and after some deliberation produced the following. Hark the herald angels sing, Beecham's pills are just the thing. <laughs> Two for an adult, one for a child, peace on earth and mercy mild. <laughs> These sentiments, particularly the ellipsis, seem to me admirably to express the rapture which is occasioned by a good effortless release. <laughs> In due course, he went up to Oxford, but convinced of the futility of his existence there, he came down after only a year and returned to Lancashire. Where I formed an orchestral society in my birthplace of St. Helens and burst upon my fellow townsmen with a series of classical concerts. My father was mayor of St. Helens that year and had invited the Halley to give a concert. Its newly appointed conductor was Hans Richter a man who enjoyed considerable prestige more by virtue of his personal association with Wagner than any individual merit. <laughs> At the eleventh hour, it was announced that Richter could not appear. Sir Joseph Beecham was in despair. I naturally suggested that I should take his place. The authorities in Manchester were aghast and appalled, but my father rose in paternal wrath and said, My son is going to conduct. And if the Alley Orchestra doesn't like it, it can stay away and I shall send to London for another band. <laughs> At eight o'clock, I lifted my baton for the first time. There were none of the hitches expected in most quarters, and hoped for in some. It was many years before the Halley and I were to meet again. A serious difference of opinion with my father led to my leaving his house. I went to London, and for the next nine years I neither saw nor heard from my father. The difference of opinion was over Joseph Beecham's treatment of his wife, which seemed unfeeling, to say the least. Love and affection and gentle nursing were all that my mother required from my father, but none were forthcoming. One day, mysteriously and without explanation, she disappeared. My father declined to say where she was. So my sister Emily and I set out to look for her. It took us a long time. 
when we did find her, she was being kept in a private mental institution in Northampton. So we got her out. And she came to live with us in London. And we took care of her. Having removed her from the asylum, Josephine Beecham's children supported her in her divorce proceedings and helped her to increase her claim for alimony. They were promptly disinherited. However, Thomas Beecham became engaged to a young American lady, Utica Wells, and moved into her family home in South Kensington. So for Beecham, life was full. I was attempting at that time to become an operatic composer. The trouble with opera in English where every word that is sung or said can be readily understood, is that our public, which has a lively sense of humour, never misses the opportunity for a laugh. <laughs> Nor did Sir Thomas. Once, when a distinguished operatic star kept complaining about his tempi, he asked her, How do you want it tonight, madam? Too fast or too slow? <laughs> And again, after conducting a particularly rapid performance with Diaghilev's celebrated Russian ballet, he said to the orchestra, That made the little buggers hop. <laughs> <laughs> Once, while rehearsing Messiah, he had occasion to criticise the Australian soprano, Thea Phillips. My dear, what is the matter with you? I'd always understood that every English-speaking child babbled the music of Messiah in the cradle. Miss Phillips assured the conductor that it would be all right at the concert. She'd been studying the score for months, she said, and she took it to bed with her every night. Oh. Well, then I'm sure we'll have an immaculate conception. <laughs> In 1904, he travelled abroad. He had been married for only a year, but his marriage was already breaking up as Utica, his wife, with their son, insisted on staying in London with her parents. During my travels, my mind turned more and more toward thoughts of conducting. After all, as I put it to myself at the time, nothing very disastrous could come of it. Why do we in England always engage at our concerts so many third-rate continental conductors when we have so many second-rate conductors of our own? <laughs> my opening essay was given at the Bechstein Hall, renamed during the war, lest intending patrons should feel guilty of some treasonous alliance, the Wigmore Hall. <laughs> my first sensation was one of disappointment with myself. Somehow I was not getting from my orchestra the sound, the tone, the general effect that I wanted. At one moment the brass would be excessive, at another inadequate, the woodwind strident or feeble, the strings feverish or flaccid. There was no balance between the component parts of the whole. Well, I thought, there could be very little doubt where the fault lay. <laughs> the deputy system. Now, you take a case. A, whom you wanted, signed to play at your concert. But he sent B, whom you didn't mind, to the first rehearsal. B, without your knowledge or agreement, sent along C, a barely adequate musician, to the second rehearsal. However, not being free to play at the concert itself, he sent D, to whom you'd have paid 50 guineas to stay away. <laughs> Even with experienced orchestras, there were sometimes misunderstandings between Beecham and his musicians. Once, in the middle of a rehearsal, he shouted, Third horn, you're flat! They played the section again. Third horn, you're still flat! But, Sir Thomas, the third horn hasn't arrived yet. Oh, well, when he does arrive, tell him he's flat. <laughs> of La Boheme, he stopped an orchestra to speak to the tenor as he lay on the bed when Mimi is dying. Mr. Nash, Mr. Nash, I can't hear you. Sing up. But how do you expect me to sing my best in this position, Sir Thomas? In that position, my dear fellow, I have performed some of my greatest achievements. <laughs> 
he enjoyed singing along with the orchestra. <laughs> I'm on my way to Paris, and my wife's going to stay at home. Boom, ba -dum, boom, ba -dum, boom, boom. I remember Sir Thomas entering the Free Trade Hall in Manchester to rehearse the Halle on a bitter, foggy morning. He took off his glasses and he polished them with a large, immaculate white linen handkerchief. And then he tapped the desk with his stick. Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Now, where are we? Delius. Does anyone feel inclined on this salubrious Manchester morning? to play in a summer garden of Delia. No, 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 thought not. <laughs> so, let us pass on to Strauss's Till Eulenspiegel. Um, hmm? uh, well, not in tonight's concert. No. It's very hard, I could have sworn it was. Oh, Don Quixote, yes, well, I knew we had to play something by Strauss. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I'm sure I don't need to tell you anything about Strauss's Don Quixote. I certainly don't intend to this morning or any other morning. So, <laughs> let us pass on to the next piece, which I believe is the Enigma Variations of Elgar. Pretty piece. Thousand pities that Elgar was lured into composing symphonies and oratorios. Well, I won't ask you to play the whole thing, but let us begin with number six, the Viola Variations. And, uh, gentlemen, if I seem to you to be lingering over much, just go ahead, take no notice of me. <laughs> It's a lovely tune. Salon music, gentlemen. Salon music. rehearsal, he would usually let an orchestra play a piece straight through before giving any notes. Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, I am thoroughly with you in your obvious reluctance to rehearse on a morning as chilly and dismal as this, but please do try and keep in touch with us from time to time. <laughs> uh, Mr. Um, what is your name? Yes. Ball, Sir Thomas. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Ball, Sir Thomas. Ball? Oh, ball! How very singular. <laughs> Once in America, he felt disinclined to rehearse the awkward cello part in Brahms' second piano concerto. Yes, I think we'll just run through the closing bars. Oh, but Sir Thomas, mm -hmm. <laughs> I must rehearse the cello part. The piece is entirely unfamiliar to me. I've never played it before. You'll love it. <laughs> Even off the podium, Beecham was beginning to be a familiar face. On one occasion, I was shopping in the emporium of Messrs. Fortnum and Mason, and I happened to notice a lady waving to me from across the department. Well, I knew her face very well, but I could not for the life of me for the moment think who she was, so I tried to escape. But too late, she was on me with her hand outstretched. Good morning, Mr. Beecham, she said, and how are you? I said, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? She said, oh, I'm extremely well, thank you. How are your family? And I said, uh, oh, well, they're all pretty well, thank you. Um, 
How are your family? She said, oh, they're extremely well, thank you. My brother's been a little under the weather lately, but nothing serious. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She said, no, no, he's just been over, overtired, a bit overdoing it, you know. He's perfectly all right, really. I said, oh, good, 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 good. Good. Um, <laughs> tell me, I said, uh, w what is your brother doing just at the moment? And she said, um, well, he's still king. <laughs> The, uh, at the beginning of the century, there was no orchestral standard to speak of. However, one day, Beecham was visited by Charles Draper, the foremost clarinetist in the country. He and a few other first-class musicians had formed a new chamber orchestra. Oh, yes, I took them on, and in 1907, I expanded them, and in the ample accommodation of the Queen's Hall, we gave a series of concerts devoted to the works of unknown composers. Beecham was determined to become London's first impresario conductor. In November 1907, an unexpected visitor to the country came to hear the new symphony orchestra. It was Frederick Delius, who had arrived only a few days before from Rome. Now, here was a composer whom I'd never seen before, whose work was quite unlike any others or anything that was being written at that time. People didn't seem to know what the devil to make of it. Well, I found it as alluring as a wayward woman, and I determined to tame it. <laughs> Wasn't done in a day. Nothing of Delius's music had been played in England since the concerts he conducted himself between 1899 and 1907. Yes, you might just as well talk to a child as talk to the average manager about Delius, or about anything out of the common. He knows about half a dozen composers, that's about it. Just as the average virtuoso on the piano or the fiddle knows about five or six concertos. Won't bother to learn any more, that'll see him through. He can go on doing those for the rest of his life. <laughs> now, a village Romeo and Juliet is, at any rate, a masterpiece. And yet you never hear it in either of our two opera houses in London. But then why should you? The public don't know it. The managers don't know it. The people who run the opera, the opera business, let's call it, they don't know the work. They don't know Irmelin. They don't know the magic fountain. Well, that's understandable. <laughs> they don't know co-anger. They don't know what is dramatic in an opera. There is a point of view rather prevalent in this country, and also in America, that an opera cannot be dramatic unless it has five or six people slaughtered on stage in conditions of horror, or at least under very disagreeable circumstances. But a charming idyll, a story of young people that is not without interest and certainly not without music and beauty, and which ends in a tragic way that is, to my view, quite remarkable. No horror. Lots of pity, but no terror. Well, that isn't dramatic. Often I'd be working on a score of his, and I'd say, now look, Frederick, about this bit here. I'd like to know what you'd like done with it. And he'd say, um, well, I can't remember now, but um, do what you like with it. Now, that's very charming, isn't it? And I've applied that principle to the work of every other composer. <laughs> Now, I can't tell you what would have happened to this music if I hadn't existed as a conductor. I can't even begin to think what would have happened. But one thing I do know, the large majority of performances of his works would have been totally unrepresentative of Frederick Delius, and that might have meant his departure from the musical scene 20 or 30 years ago. Yes, that I do know.
Now, I see from an announcement that I am to give you a talk on Mozart. Well, I want to make it quite clear at the outset that I could not possibly give a talk on Mozart in one hour or two or even three. I should need at least a month for the task. Now, had I said that 50 years ago, I should have been greeted with a roar of laughter. Nothing so remarkable has happened in my time, in the entire field of music, as the revaluation all over this earth of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. When I first entered the musical scene in London, not an unmusical place as big towns go, <laughs> I found that the public as well as the press was acquainted with three out of the 41 symphonies, two pianoforte concertos, two or three sonatas for pianoforte and two operas, very imperfectly, with a complete lack of understanding as to their contents and meaning, and that was about all. <laughs> so I made up my mind to do what I could to improve the situation. Now, I had known Massenet, who loved Mozart, and I'd known Saint-Saëns very well, and he loved Mozart, and Humperdinck. <laughs> and <laughs> my father had known Gounod very well, and he worshipped Mozart, and he'd known Brahms and Warshak, and they loved Mozart, and they were all of a mind that this man was the most remarkable musical genius the world had ever seen, and that the present attitude towards him was one of the mysteries of the age. And then, Suddenly, for no reason, the wheel turned, and it turned in the right direction, and people began listening to Mozart with new ears. I had the honour of presenting the first production of Cosi Fan Tutte in this country, the first public performance. Uh, that was in 1910, only 120 years after the death of the composer. <laughs> it's rather a record, that, to be <laughs> 120 years took to get here, yeah. Well, 50 years ago, I could not have given a concert of Mozart and expected a full house. Nowadays, if I give almost any sort of concert, almost anywhere, and stick in a bit of Mozart, the people will come. <laughs> it's almost impossible under these changed conditions to escape success. <laughs> <laughs> not suggesting I want to. <laughs> 650 works, ladies and gentlemen, and all of them written within the space of 35 years. An ingenious friend of mine who had a flair for mathematics set his mind to working out how long Mozart must have written for every day, considering only the notes he wrote between the ages of 20 and 35. It took him a long time. And he discovered that Mozart must have written for not less than eight hours every day. Now think of that. Eight hours of writing every day for 15 years. So the question arises, when did this fellow think? <laughs> I mean, he, he must have eaten, must have drunk. Presumably he slept from time to time. People, you know, always have this extraordinary idea that the music of Mozart is very agreeable and easy to sing. It's very difficult music indeed to sing and to play. In fact, I don't know anything so difficult because, you see, the thing is, the fellow writes in such a way that every note counts. I mean, it's not like the music of my old friend Richard Strauss or um, <laughs> Frederick Delius. There are pages and pages in their music where you can uh, extract a few thousand notes, you know, and nobody's very much the wiser, but you can't do it with Mozart. One note played a little off-key by the 19th violin provokes almost a resentment in the conductor, uneasiness in the audience, and, of course, exasperation in the press. <laughs>
once in the 1930s, rather to my surprise, he told me that he planned to present Alban Berg's Wozzeck at Covent Garden. I shall go into the country and study the score. Three weeks later, I was asked to lunch. How about a sherry? May I have a white lady? Oh, help yourself. Why are you playing Puccini, Sir Thomas? I am trying to wash Wozzeck from my mind and memory. <laughs> I am not interested in music or in any other form of art that fails to stimulate enjoyment of life and what is more, pride in life. I believe you're conducting Elgar's A-flat symphony next week. The last occasion I remember you made some pretty severe cuts. Didn't Sir Edward mind? Oh, yes, he did. So next week, as we are performing in the birthplace of Sir Edward, we are giving the piece in its entirety with all the repeats. Elgar's A-flat symphony is a very large work. <laughs> there are many large works. Maybe, but this is a particularly large work. <laughs> Neo-Gothic. <laughs> the musical equivalent of St Pancras Station. <laughs> Beecham enjoyed the telephone. It gave him the opportunity to score heavily or to terminate an exchange abruptly. On one occasion in New York, or so he asked me to believe. Who is this? Is that Sir Thomas Beachham? It is. Well, I'm the secretary of the English-speaking Union of New York. I beg your pardon? Are you Sir Thomas Beachham? I am. Well, I'm telling you, I'm the secretary of the English-speaking Union of New York. I don't believe you. Good night. <laughs> Back in England in 1909, Beecham produced his first London opera, Ethel Smythe's The Wreckers at His Majesty's Theatre. And so began his lifelong battle with singers. At a rehearsal of The Wreckers, as he reached the final drowning catastrophe, the hero stopped in his tracks. What's the matter, Mr. Coates? I was just wondering, is this the place where I'm supposed to be drowned by the waves or by the orchestra? <laughs> Singers always seem to want to be heard above the music. <laughs> I make jolly sure they're not. <laughs> this um, opera, though, this opera, The Wreckers, was the occasion of my reunion with my father. I discovered that he'd become keenly interested in my doings and had a habit of slipping into a remote seat at the back of a concert hall and then stealing away before the end, lest his presence be discovered and reported to me. We were to give a gala performance of the wreckers before the king and queen. Somehow this news was murmured in advance to my father and we could not keep him away from the theatre. I remember pointing him out to Ethel Smythe, hiding behind a pillar. The reunion itself took place in a lawyer's office. He said, you know, Tom, you annoyed me. I said, well, you annoyed me. <laughs> that day we lunched together and dined together and played duets on the organ and piano far into the night and were once again as brothers. Beecham was himself his most thoroughly rehearsed production. When he was middle-aged, dapper Mr. Beecham, he seemed in the eyes and ears of many people to be the personification in excelsis of the bounder. At that time, Beecham was not a popular figure. Why doesn't he pay his income tax, the British people asked, not knowing the complications of his financial affairs, and complicated they were, they occupied an army of accountants. One, having wrestled all through the night with a problem, called on Sir Thomas the next morning. Sir Thomas, I have been going over your affairs until the crack of dawn. I should like you to enlighten me on one most crucial point. And what is that? Do you owe, or are you owed, two million pounds? The answer is in the affirmative. <laughs> in both cases. After an action when he was cited as correspondent in 1910, the British public was equally unsympathetic to his marital arrangements. Why doesn't he live with Lady Beecham, they asked. At about this time, he walked to the conductor's desk in Birmingham in complete silence. 
He bowed to the audience. Not a hand clap, not a sound. He turned to the orchestra. Let us pray. <laughs> At the end of one of his many trials with the income tax commissioners, after which he was finally declared bankrupt, the judge asked, but Sir Thomas, what did you spend all your money on? On music, my lord. But what was the good of that? <laughs> Surely, if we are a musical nation, we should have fine British artists, concert halls, municipal orchestras, and a thousand and one musical things that other countries boast of. The truth is, you have so allowed yourselves to be flattered to a state of self-conceit that not only are you the musical laughingstock of the world, but you are content to listen to rotten foreign singers, rotten foreign pianists, rotten foreign orchestras, and what is more, rotten foreign conductors as well. <laughs> Toscanini. What do I think of Toscanini? A glorified Italian bandmaster. <laughs> You've heard those lively band competitions in Paris? Hmm? Well, Toscanini had find his metier there. <laughs> Much is made of the fact that he conducts without a score, but Toscanini is so short-sighted he wouldn't be able to read a score. <laughs> But though it is generally known that he always conducts from memory, and though it is generally known that he's almost half blind, nobody apparently is aware that he's also stone deaf. That's true. <laughs> it should perhaps be pointed out that Toscanini, in his turn, always referred to Sir Thomas as Pagliaccio. Look, I am not the only conductor in this country. On the other hand, I'm better than any damned foreigner. <laughs> now, you take Malcolm Sarge. Oh, no. You'll have to call him Sir Malcolm now. Why? Well, didn't you know he'd been knighted? No. I knew he'd been doctored. <laughs> yeah, poor old Malcolm. We always used to call him Flash Harry. Now, Malcolm is an extremely accomplished musician and an incredibly accomplished conductor. I appointed him as my deputy. <laughs> knowing that my orchestra would be in safe hands while I was away. Now, you take my advice. If ever you appoint a deputy, choose one that you can trust technically, but his calibre should be such that the public are always very pleased to see you back again. <laughs> he did have an enormous success in Tokyo. Good Lord, Malcolm, in Tokyo, what was he doing there? Conducting. Oh. Flash in Japan. <laughs> When he was conducting there one night, a gun went off in the audience. I had no idea the Japanese were so musical. <laughs> in 1916, Beecham was knighted, and it was at this time, too, that his father's death threw all his affairs into confusion, and he came by the reputation of being bankrupt. Beecham's worried financial advisor was James White, who operated from a suite in the Grand Hotel in London. One morning, as Sir Thomas was sitting in White's outer office, a Lancashire businessman burst in, demanding an immediate interview with White. Uh, I'm afraid he's engaged at the moment. Well, I've got to see him. I've got a lot of brass at stake. Uh, how much? A bloody lot, and I won't go away till I've seen him. Well, yes, but how much? Now, I'm £14,000. Jimmy, petty cash. <laughs> In the 1930s, emerging from a period of ill health and harassed by his creditors, his tongue frequently lashed out in all directions at the people of Birmingham. Your town hall is one of the last places in the world that anyone would wish to sing or play in. Everything is wrong with it, except the outside. <laughs> of one of his esteemed colleagues. Sir Adrian Bolt came round to see me this morning, positively reeking of horlicks. 
<laughs> of Sydney Harbour Bridge uh, to the proud mayor of Sydney. I don't like it. Why don't you have it removed? <laughs> I think the public are getting rather tired of me after all these years. I've been overworking myself. <clears throat> he planned a year's complete rest from music. But a serious event put the London Philharmonic Orchestra into liquidation and also put paid to the holiday. The outbreak of war. I heard there was a state of national emergency, so I emerged. <laughs> he did not leave England until the spring of 1940. There is only one man to lead our country at this time of crisis. He has done it before and he can do it again. And the name of that man is Lloyd George. The next day, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. <laughs> In Australia, a BBC radio reporter was assigned to interview Sir Thomas as soon as he landed in Sydney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sir Thomas. I've been asked to conduct an interview with you over the wireless. Delighted, my dear fellow. Have you talked over the air before, Sir Thomas? Uh, no, I think not. Ah, well, then perhaps it would be sensible if we were to practice, you know, rehearse a Oh, little. I think not, I think not. I much prefer just to improvise. You ask me any questions you like, you know, just to say anything you want, just to get me going. After all, my dear fellow, it's me that listeners want to hear, isn't it? <laughs> And so we went on the air without rehearsal, without preparation of any kind. Australia waited for a feast of wit. Now, Sir Thomas, you are about to conduct orchestras entirely strange to you. Tell me, do you believe in the old saying that there are no good or bad professional orchestras, only good or bad conductors? What precisely do you mean? <laughs> Well, um, I, I was asking if you believed in the saying that there are no good or bad orchestras, only good or bad conductors. <sighs> I, I believe it was Von Bulow who said it. Was it really? Hmm. <laughs> uh, do you intend to conduct much Mozart? Well, whether I conduct, to use your phrase, much Mozart, depends entirely upon the condition of orchestras here, about which I receive no information whatsoever. I, um... I... I... I, I believe you intend to include some Berlioz. Quite possibly. <laughs> and Delius? Well, I see no reason why not. <laughs> Could I ask... You know, you're talking too much. <laughs> Great deal too much. It's me the listeners want to hear, you know, not you. Now, please, try not to interrupt. Sir Thomas. Thank you, my dear fellow.
Many of Australia's best instrumentalists were away at the war. In Brisbane, Beecham rehearsed the prelude to Tristan and Isolde in a schoolroom. A greying lady led the cellos, a music teacher. She drew her bow passionately, but her tone was excruciating. Madam, you have between your legs an instrument capable of bringing delight to thousands. <laughs> and all you can do is scratch it. Sir Thomas didn't really like to have women in his orchestras. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, so, here, yeah, please. I didn't mean it. It wasn't that he objected to them on musical grounds. He simply maintained that if they weren't good-looking, it upset his players. And if they were good-looking, it upset him. <laughs> on one occasion, after a concert, he was visited in his dressing room by an extremely attractive young lady who asked if he would do her the honour of becoming godfather to her child. Delighted, my dear. But why bring God into it? <laughs> this from the man who married three women and had famous liaisons with others. At the end of the war, Beecham and his new wife, the pianist Betty Humby, returned to England in a Dutch cargo boat. As soon as he landed, Sir Thomas was run to ground in a Liverpool barber's shop. He was asked what he was doing there. I always come to Liverpool for a shave. <laughs> The restrictions of wartime England proved no obstacle to Sir Thomas. One afternoon, a certain Dr. Hunt was sitting in his consulting rooms in Sloane Street when the telephone rang. Dr. Hunt, this is Sir Thomas Beecham speaking. You don't know me, but I am in urgent need of your professional services. Kindly drive at once to my home, number 143, Hamilton Terrace, Northwest 8. I shall be much obliged. Reluctantly, the doctor cancelled his appointments and drove to St. John's Wood, where he was astonished to find Sir Thomas in full evening dress and apparently in the pink of condition. Dr. Hunt, I presume. But, Sir Thomas, I understood you were ill in bed. My dear fellow, who said anything about my being ill? In point of fact, I'm due to conduct tonight at the Royal Albert Hall. No, my difficulty is how to get there. Due to petrol rationing, my car is immobile. <laughs> Taxis are unobtainable. I have appealed in vain to the fire brigade, and public transport is out of the question. Doctors seem to be the only people who can move around nowadays. <laughs> now, on your way back to Sloane Street, you will pass directly by the Royal Albert Hall. I shall be most grateful for a lift. I don't know that if you and your wife are fond of music, in case you are, here are two tickets for the concert tonight, and I hope that afterwards you'll be good enough to drive me home. <laughs> Beecham got his lift to the Albert Hall. Dr. and Mrs. Hunt went to the concert, drove him home afterwards, stayed for supper, and remained close friends for the rest of his life. Despite the war, Beecham was still full of ambition for British music. I'm going to found one more great orchestra to round off my career, my fifth, the Royal Philharmonic, which is going to be the greatest orchestra ever. People always tell me I will not get the players. I always do. I get the finest players in the country. They're so good they refuse to play under anybody except me. Sir Thomas, I have heard that you're occasionally conducting from a score these days. Yes, but I don't like it. A score at a performance gets between the conductor and his orchestra. Short circuits personal rays of influence. Do you think there will always be audiences for live music? Oh, yes. Yeah. Don't neglect the receptive power of the audience. I never fail to consider it. I don't agree with Mahler's maxim that if a slow movement's not going any too well, then play it even slower. No. I, <laughs> if I sense any tedium or lack of interest in the audience, I quicken the tempo, play it a bit louder. Never conduct over an audience's head. It's an impertinence to do that. Besides, there is the not unimportant question of whether the music is beginning to bore me. If it is, very well. I just go ahead and get it over with as quickly as possible. <laughs> Illness forced Lady Betty to withdraw from the concert platform. And in 1958, just as he was about to begin a brilliant season in Buenos Aires, she suffered a fatal heart attack. Beecham was brusque with sympathizers. I don't want sympathy. I don't want all that guff. I just want to be left alone. On his return to London, a man who knew him by some extraordinary mischance had not heard of his bereavement. Sir Thomas, oh. how good to see you again. And how's Betty? She's on tour with Vaughan Williams. <laughs> he was a comedian, or as this is a term which the English associate with red-nosed buffoonery, I had better describe him as an artist in comedy. 
but he was not a wit in the epigrammatic way of Oscar Wilde. Sir Thomas indulged not so much in wit as in waggery. He was not 18th century in manner in the least. He belonged entirely to the 19th century. When he appeared one Saturday morning at one of Sir Robert Mayer's children's concerts in his 75th year, he walked slowly and heavily to the rostrum. When he arrived there, he bowed to the little boys and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, I should not like you to think that my almost imperceptible progress to the podium this morning was due to any reluctance on my part to perform to an audience of children. No, my slow progress was due entirely, I'm afraid, to the infirmities of old age. Now, the first piece on our program this morning is by Mozart. He wrote it at the age of... Well, when he was about your age, sir. I came to love him, his poses and his high disdain, his courteousness and his rudeness, his intolerance and his generosity. At my last meeting with him... Oh, a white lady for my friend, he drinks nothing else. <laughs> he calmly planned his next decade or so. I shall conduct only 18th century French music of a very select order. He would buy a house in France. The only civilized place left on the face of the earth. He would conduct few operas. No singers for me today, my dear fellow. They all want microphones. Life, he was beginning to realize, begins at 70. In fact, the first 70 years are the worst. <laughs> and his philosophy of life? Try everything once, except incest and folk dancing. <laughs> Cosmopolitan and Lancastrian, a man in whom wit was enriched by humour, in whom knowledge was changed to culture by sensibility, a complex man of uninhibited mind and temperament, bland, enigmatic, impulsive, selective and uh, quite often capricious. At his 70th birthday, Telegrams and cables from distinguished persons arrived from all over the world. Congratulations, greetings, Strauss, Stravinsky, Hindemith, Sibelius, <laughs> Nothing from Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> At 80, he conducted Goosen's newly scored Messiah. At a rehearsal, he had noticed the simpering manner in which a chorus of elderly spinsters had been singing, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, come along, ladies. A little more joy, please. And not quite so much astonishment. <laughs> In 1957, Thomas Beecham was asked to make a speech at the University of Congress in Washington. He chose to address his public upon a subject very dear to his heart, the changing world of music. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of this address is really little more than the memories, the recollections and the experiences of about 65 years of music on my part. Of the world of music that I knew as a boy, practically nothing today remains as it was. It may interest you to know that no one in any country has written a good tune for over 30 years. Now, think of it, you who profess to love music. If you profess to practice it or to cherish it, how do you do so? You remember the melodies of the great composers. You remember the melodies of Bach and Handel and the operas of Mozart with scores of splendid tunes and the great songs of Schubert and Schumann and the tunes of Haydn and Brahms and Borschak and others. You, they haunt your minds and memories. You think of them as you get up in the morning and you recall them to yourselves again as you go to bed at night. That is cherishing music. Now then, how much serious music written over the last 25 years can you cherish and go to bed with? I have on many occasions in mixed communities invited any of those present to get up upon a chair or a table and sing to me any aria that has been composed over the last 30 years. And no one has been able to respond to the invitation because they could not remember the tune. Memory. No, you've got to see the music. Then you can scarcely believe it. <laughs> it's like the farmer. A farmer who went to the zoo, saw the giraffe the first time, he gazed at it for 25 minutes, and then as he turned away slowly, he was heard to remark, I don't believe it. <laughs> I knew every one of the melodies of Mozart from beginning to end by the time I was 10 or 11 years old. I never wavered in my devotion to the mistunes. Never. I were a dictator, I would make it compulsory for everyone between the ages of eight and eighty to listen to Mozart for a quarter of an hour every day for five years. Now then, I call this little talk the changing world of music. Changing world. It was something like heaven 60 years ago. And I won't go so far as to suggest that it has reached the precise antipodes, <laughs> but it is going there <laughs> rapidly. His last concert was at the Portsmouth Guildhall with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra on May the 7th, 1960. He seemed conscious that this was a special occasion. He stood all his musicians' lunch at the Queen's Hotel and afterwards told them that the rehearsal would not be a long one. It was also cup final day. 
and Sir Thomas was a passionate supporter of Blackburn Rovers, one of the finalists. But even allowing for his interest in the match, the short rehearsal period was most unusual. Good afternoon, gentlemen and ladies. He merely checked the opening and the ending of Haydn's military symphony. Now, uh, where are the military gentlemen? Over there. Right, um, what have you got? Give an account of yourselves. Um, what are you playing? Triangle, Sir Thomas. Yes. Is there a side drum? No, Sir Thomas. Not in this piece at all. What a pity. It's very remiss of Haydn. Writes a military symphony, limits himself to three percussion. Have to do something about that before we finish with it. Right, well, uh, let's hear it. First movement, please, uh, gentlemen. Um, uh, from Let Us See, if you would. I haven't played it for about 40 years. <laughs> Now, gentlemen, let us get down to the important business of the day. <laughs> and so we sat there and we watched the cup final. end of Portsmouth Promenade, beside the square tower, a bench, an ordinary public park bench, inscribed with Thomas Beecham's name, commemorates this last concert. Nearby, more solemn plaques salute great naval heroes and events in English naval history. Somehow it seems fitting that Beecham should be honoured with the fighting men of his nation, for his life was a series of battles fought with enormous courage on behalf of his country's music. And his enemies were the press, the music critics, the income tax commissioners, and at times, the British public itself. When, at the end of his life, it took him to its heart, we knew that he had won his battles. And while I wonder that for some years this was the only public memorial to one of the greatest Englishmen of our age, I sometimes think that if Tommy's ghost were to ever walk the battlements of old Portsmouth, he would give an approving nod to this simple memorial. The years are nothing. Thought and feeling, principally feeling, are all that matters. Say what you want to say, firmly and with conviction. The only thing that counts in playing, in conducting, well, yes, even in misconducting, is this. Whatever you do, do it with conviction. Come along, gentlemen. Let's show them what we can do.
Ladies and gentlemen, in upwards of 60 years of concert giving, it has seldom been my good fortune to find a programme printed correctly. <laughs> Tonight is no exception to the rule, <laughs> and therefore, with your indulgence, we will now play you the piece that you think you have just heard. LAUGHTER